Hello and welcome back to Understanding the Gospel. Uh, my name is Lee Robinson. I'm from Citywide Baptist Church in New London. Uh, we're located at 325 Broad Street in New London. Uh, this is Understanding the Gospel, a 12-week teaching series uh, going through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus, his first words of preaching when he came into the world, he said, repent and believe the gospel. Uh, we've been going through and, and laying a foundation. Uh, we first talked about uh, the fact that the gospel, it means the good news. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, he came into the world. Uh, he died for the sins of the world, that he rose from the dead. And today he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. The Bible says to make intercession for us before God uh, so that our sins can be forgiven. And so that by placing our faith in him, we can have eternal life and not suffer the punishment of eternal hell. Uh, so uh, we've been laying the groundwork uh, through through the, the good news, uh, in order to understand good news, uh, you first need to know that there's bad news. We talked about the fact that God is our authority, uh, and He's our authority by virtue of the fact that He created us. Since He created us, He is our authority. We are accountable to Him, just like a parent with their, with their children. Uh, a parent has the right, the authority, to uh, give commandments, to give rules to their children, and it's good and right uh, and, and a great thing that children should obey their parents. They should. That's something that should happen. Uh, we, we know that. We, we laid that foundation. So God is our, our creator, our authority. He has laws, and those laws are, are in a simple way, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we went through the Ten Commandments, and we, show, we showed that uh, every human being has broken the Ten Commandments, that uh, God is our judge. He has laws. Every one of, every one of us have broken his laws. Uh, do not lie. Do not steal. Uh, do not, Jesus uh, brought the commandment to the heart. He said, if you look uh, as a man, if you look on a woman uh, to lust after her, you've committed a, adultery with her already in your heart. Uh, everyone has broken God's laws. And what we saw is just like in a, in a worldly system, in a worldly court system, uh, when we break laws, uh, we're lawbreakers, we're guilty, we're not innocent. We go to court, we stand before a judge, and we're punished accordingly, at least in a righteous law system. Uh, a good judge, a righteous judge, would punish those who break the law. The uh, same thing was true with God, that God is called in Genesis chapter 18. He's called the just judge of all the earth. Uh, should he not do what's right? Because God is a good God, because he is a just God and righteous, he has to punish sin. Uh, we talked about from Luke chapter 16, Jesus uh, taught us a, sto a story about a, a man uh, that died and went to hell. We, we saw that, uh, that hell is a literal place. It's an eternal place. It's a place where there's a consci consciousness. Uh, it's a place of torment forever, uh, separated from God with no end and no way to return from that place. Uh, that is the punishment that we rightly deserve from God. We've offended a holy God. We deserve a holy punishment. We've offended an eternal law. We deserve uh, a punishment of eternal sentence. Uh, but, but that's the bad news, and so we've been coming into the good news. Uh, that being that uh, God, even though these things are true, the bad news, the good news is that God loves us, that he's not a God that's quick to be angry. He has no delight in um, people's plight, in their, in their death, and in their sentence of hell. He has no pleasure in that. In fact, the Bible says that he created hell for the devil and his angels, not for uh, mankind. He does not want to punish us. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We saw from uh, uh, Exodus chapter 34 that the Lord proclaimed his name uh, before Moses. He passed by Moses and he described himself by saying, uh, gracious and merciful, long-suffering, slow to anger, of great mercy, uh, that God is a God of mercy. He does not want to give people what they deserve and he's a God of grace. He will, he's offering to people what we don't deserve. And because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his grace, throughout all history, and even before the foundations of the world, 
he started a plan. He enacted, he enacted a plan uh, that even though he created the world knowing that we would fall and knowing that we would sin, um, he didn't desire that we would sin, but he knew it was going to happen before the foundations of the world. Uh, God enacted a plan, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they would all be involved uh, in redeeming man and buying mankind back, bringing them back to their creator, even though they've sinned. And that was through Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice, uh, that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. God had already made a way for us to be forgiven. Uh, Last week we saw The idea of a sacrifice, uh, that that's the way that's necessary for us to be forgiven. God can't just uh, say you're forgiven without there being some kind of loss. There has to be a basis uh, that God can be just in forgiving the sins of mankind. And the way that that's possible is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And we went through through the scriptures from uh, Genesis all the way through to Revelation that talked about the, the necessity for there to be bloodshed the necessity of a sacrifice, uh, the necessity of uh, a, a, a basis for forgiveness. Uh, so that brings us to today. Uh, this is episode number seven. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk more now uh, about the person of Jesus Christ. I want to focus right in on uh, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Because, uh, you know, Jesus said to repent and believe the gospel. The way that we're saved is it centers right in on this person. Without Jesus, uh, there's no gospel. Without Jesus, there is no Christianity. Uh, the, the focus of the whole Bible of Christianity, it all goes to this one person, Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and I want to answer the question, who is he? Uh, who, who is Jesus? And as a result, we'll see that uh, uh, who he is, we'll, we'll, that will show us what he did and why it was so important for what he did. Um, if I was to ask you the question tonight, uh, who, who is Jesus? What would you say? Many people have different ideas about who Jesus is. And uh, the Apostle Paul said in the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, he actually said that there is many Jesuses. There's a lot of Jesuses. And what do you mean there's many Jesuses? Uh, for example, uh, if you ask someone that um, follows Islam, uh, they, would, they would tell you that Jesus is you know, uh, he was a prophet, he was a a great teacher, uh, but they would not say that he was the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, He was not the eternal son of God that became flesh and died for the sins of mankind. Um, So even though they say that they do believe in Jesus, they believe in a different Jesus than the one of the Bible. Uh, Same thing with Catholics. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus uh, was Michael the archangel. Uh, Mormons say that uh, Jesus is Satan's brother. So there's a lot of different Jesuses out there. It'd be kind of like if I uh, said to you, do you know somebody, um, uh, I'll use uh, Joe because he's here with us. Do you, do you know uh, Joseph Roberts? Um, and you'd say, yeah, he's a you know, really, really tall guy, really, really dark skin, um, big, huge muscles and everything. Yeah, I know Joe Roberts. And I'd say, ah, no, 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 no that's not Joe. Uh, no offense, Joe, but you, know, you don't have really, really big muscles like this, okay? And, and you don't have really dark skin either. So even though uh, he has the same name, uh, it's, n- it's not the same person. So many people talk about Jesus, uh, they have ideas about Jesus, but there's a lot of different Jesuses out there. What we want to focus on tonight is who is the Jesus of the Bible and why is it important concerning the gospel? What are the implications? What, um, why is it important for who he was as concerning the gospel? Uh, so... Uh, many people say that Jesus, you know, was just a, he was a, just a great teacher. He was a moral man. Some people say he was a prophet. So what does the scripture say? And what we're going to see is this, is that Jesus is the eternal God. He's the eternal son of God uh, that became a man. He, he was without beginning, without end. God himself, the son of God, who became a man. And the purpose for him coming was not to be a good example, necessarily, um, it was not to be some a prophet. The reason, the real reason that he came was to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And uh, we'll see as a result, uh, there's a few things that only Jesus can claim to be. He's the only one that can claim to be the high priest for God. He's the only one that can claim to be the advocate, uh, the, the lawyer, the mediator between God and men. And we'll see those things in detail. 
Uh, so first of all, what we want to see is that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ, who is he? Uh, first of all, Jesus Christ is eternal. He's the eternal God or the Son of God. Uh, now, as we start, I want to make a distinction. There's, uh, some, there's ways that Jesus is called in the Bible. First, he's called the Son of God, uh, but he's also called the Son of Man. So what do we mean by those terms? When we say that Jesus was the Son of God, uh, what, it's, what it's really teaching is that Jesus is God the Son, that God is a trinity. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That it's one God uh, of equal essence, but three distinct persons. So sort of kind of like a human being, there's one, one being, uh, but I have different parts, body, soul, spirit. There's a division in my being. Same thing's true with God. Uh, we see that in Genesis chapter 1, uh, when, when God was creating the universe, uh, it says, and God said, let us make man in our own image. Who was he talking to? When, when God said, let us make man in his own image, was he talking to uh, the angels? Uh, it can't be because he was saying, let us make man. So angels were not involved in the creating process. The only people that are involved in the creating process is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's an idea of a, a unity, a plural unity, that God is one God in three persons. So, so when we say that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, it's not meaning that uh, God himself, that the Father, uh, that he, you know, had relations with a woman and he had a son, and that's why they call him the Son of God. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that he is God the Son. That's the part of God that he is, God the Son. When we say that Jesus was the Son of Man, uh, what that's, that's referring to not his deity, not his Godhead, but it's talking about him as a man, that he was the son of man. When the Bible uh, talks about being the son of something, if it's, uh, it's, it's showing that this is the perfect um, resemblance of something. So if I said, uh, you know, uh, she is the, the daughter of beauty, I would be saying that if you could think about beauty, she's the daughter of beauty. She's the, the example of it, the model of that. Uh, if I said he's the son of strength, uh, a good example um, uh, is Barnabas. The, the guy in, in the Bible, his name Barnabas, means the son of consolation, the son of comfort. So the, the people, when they looked at Barnabas, they, saw, they thought, you know, if, if we could think of comfort as a person, this is him right here. It's the son of comfort, Barnabas. So when Jesus, he's the son of man, what it's, thinking is, what it's saying is that when we could think of what a perfect man would be, the model man, the, the man that God wanted to create, we would look to Jesus. We would say he was um, the son of man. He was the second Adam. He was the, the, real, the real deal, the man that God designed, the, the man that everybody else should look at. He's the model man. He's the son of man. Okay, so we see that, uh, we're going to see that Jesus is the eternal son of God that became a man. Um, some places that we see this in the Old Testament um, Genesis chapter 1, that Jesus was involved in the creating process. Only God is the creator. Uh, in the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, uh, we, find, we find Joshua about to go into Jericho. And we see something here that he sees this man. And uh, Joshua basically said to this man, are you, are you for our enemies or are you for us? And uh, the, the captain of the uh, host of the Lord, he said, I am captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face and to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Uh, if you know anything about the scriptures, you know that God alone is worthy of worship. When the apostle John in the Bible, uh, when he tried to worship angels, they told him to stand up, don't worship me, worship God alone, worship God. So here we find Joshua, a man of God, falling down to worship this man. The man did not rebuke him, but, but even more than that, he said, take off your shoes because this ground whereon you stand is holy. That's the same thing that Moses did when he was uh, talking to the Lord, the I am, the eternal God that was in the burning bush. Uh, this, whoever this man was, he was claiming to be God himself as a man. Um, uh, Muslims as well as Jews, they reject the idea that God would ever become a man. Um, but here, this is refuted right here in the Bible, that here's a man being worshipped, and there was a holy man of God that was worshipping him, and the man did not refuse him. 
Um, God is, his, his, one of the names that he's claimed is Emmanuel. And what Emmanuel means is God with us. God came to be with us. Uh, just to make the point right here, uh, some people mistake, the, have a, a misunderstanding. They think that Jesus, he started when he was born in the manger. You know, Christmas, that's when Jesus started. That's when the life of Christ began. That's not true. Jesus never had a beginning. Um, he is, he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am uh, the eternal God of the Bible. He never had a beginning. At a certain time, he came into the world. He had a beginning as a man, but that's not when his life started. He was not conceived. He was not created. Uh, we see in uh, Psalms chapter number 45, uh, which is quoted uh, many times in the New Testament, uh, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, referring to Jesus Christ, not to God the Father, not to um, what many people see as Jehovah in the Bible. It says, The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And the, here we see it. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Here it's not referring to God because God anointed him um, as the king that has an eternal kingdom. This is speaking about the Son of God, that God that became man. He has an eternal kingdom. It's the eternal, the eternal one. That's Jesus Christ. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 7. Uh, we'll go over there and read it. Isaiah 7 and verse number 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We'll get back to the uh, virgin birth in a little bit. Uh, but here we see that a virgin will conceive. When, uh, when Mary, uh, the, the mother of Jesus, when, when Mary conceived in her womb, it, it was not with um, sexual relations with another man. That never happened. Um, here's this woman that was uh, uh, engaged, basically, to, to Joseph. They were not married yet, and she a miraculous conception inside of her womb. It was a miraculous conception, um, conceived of the Holy Ghost. The eternal God, Jesus Christ, came into the womb of a woman and became a man without uh, an earthly man involved. He says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And you see that in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, it says, For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And listen to this. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Who is the Mighty God but the one God alone, the one true God? The Mighty God is going to become a man. He's going to, a child is going to be born. That's going to be his name. It says, The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Uh, what are we doing? We're seeing that Jesus Christ is God, that he is the eternal God who became a man. Is that who you think of Jesus as being? Was he just a moral man, a moral teacher, a great prophet, a great man, like one of the exemplary men that came on in, into the world scene. Was that all he was? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that he is your creator, that he is the one that thought you up before you were even existed, and it's by his power that he brought you into existence. That is the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, we also see in the book of Micah, uh, chapter 5, in verse number 2, it says, uh, but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. From everlasting, this one that will be born in Bethlehem. He was eternal. Uh, the, the prophet Daniel, also he was talking about the, uh, the mountain, and he, and he referred to the rock that was cut out as the Ancient of Days. Uh, him, Jesus, he's the eternal one. So we see that in the Old Testament, as we, we go over into the New Testament, we find right off Matthew chapter 1, uh, the, the birth of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, becomes a man. He is born. They call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God became a man. Uh, we see that his name is called Jesus, 
which means Jehovah is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. Uh, his name is referring to God himself that came to save the world. Uh, we see in John chapter 1, uh, very clearly, uh, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, the Word referring to, uh, you know, if we have, uh, when we talk about communication, uh, we have thoughts inside of our heart and our mind, and our thoughts are communicated in words. And so this is what the Bible's referring to when it talks about the Word of God, uh, speaking of Jesus, that He's called the Word of God. Uh, what is this meaning? It's meaning that God has thoughts. He has uh, ideas. He has purposes. He has plans that He wants to communicate to the world. And, the, and the, the, the best way, the most express way that he's communicated those thoughts to this world is by becoming a man in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the Word of God, because he came to communicate God. In one place here in John chapter 1, it says that he came to exegete God. Uh, what does it mean to exegete God? It, it means to, to bring out um, details about God, that he came to declare to manifest God to the world. So it says here in John chapter 1 that the Word was God. He was with God, but He was God. Um, we, see, we understand that by the Trinity. Uh, and then it says down in verse number 13, uh, excuse me, in verse number 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, if you go over to, to John chapter 8, we see Jesus having an argument with the, uh, with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were um, confused about what Jesus was saying. They, were, they basically asked him the question, Who are you making yourself? Who are you saying that you are? Are you saying that you're better than Abraham, our forefather, the one who was on the earth like 2,000 years ago? And Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. The same scripture that... Uh, God at the burning bush where Moses, he said, I am, which means Yahweh, the self-existing one. Jesus, they asked him, who are you saying you are? <clears throat> and Jesus said, the one that didn't have a beginning, the, the self-existing one, I am. I'm the one that's talking to you. <clears throat> in uh, John chapter 10, in verse 33, there's, there's no mistaking this whatsoever, um, who Jesus was claiming to be. Uh, listen to the, the scriptures in John chapter 10. In verse 33, uh, it says, uh, Jesus, uh, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Um, Jesus asked them, they said, Why are you picking up stones to stone me? For which of my good works? I've done a lot of good works. Which one are you stoning me for? They said, No, not for your good works, but because you are claiming to be God that became a man. That's blasphemy, and you deserve to be stoned. So they clearly understood what he was claiming to be. That's the claim of Jesus. He said, I am God that has become a man. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 makes it very clear. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God became a man. Uh, one more scripture in the New Testament uh, speaking about who Jesus is. Uh, Philippians chapter number 2. Uh, Philippians chapter number 2, <clears throat> and it says this. Uh, it says in verse number 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now, just to break this down for a second, it says that Jesus, that he, he was in the form of God. Now, we, now we know that God is a spirit. He, he's, um, he doesn't necessarily, this isn't re really referring to necessarily his form, but it's speaking of the fact that before Jesus was a man in his pre-incarnate uh, existence, he was in heaven as God, that he was existing there uh, as God in the sense that there was angels worshiping him, he had all authority, all power, all dominion, all glory. That's who he was. He existed in the form of God. And it says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Or in other words, um, that he didn't, he didn't think that it was something that he needed to hold on to. Um, Jesus wasn't up in heaven thinking, 
you know what, I need to make sure, I need to secure my kingdom and make sure that everybody up here knows that I'm God, and I need to stay here and make sure everybody bows down to me. Uh, no, it, it, was, it was in fact the exact opposite. Jesus didn't need to prove anything. He knew that he was God. He knew that he uh, was worthy of worship, and he didn't count it as something that he needed to hold on to. But instead, what he did was he let it go. He emptied himself. He, he stepped down out of heaven. Uh, he was willing to let go of the glory, to let go of the, the power and the riches and the honor uh, and, the, and the eternal dominion. He, he let it go, and he stepped down into the world. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a man. Even more than that, he took on him the form of a servant. He was born from a poor, um, a poor family into the Jewish race, which was an outcasted, hated, despised people out of all the people in the world. He should have come into the world with pomp and with glory, crowned as a king, but no, he didn't. He became a servant. And why did he come? Uh, and this is what we're going to get into here in a little bit. Why he came? Why did that eternal God, that eternal son of God, who didn't have to come into the world, he didn't have to create the world, didn't have to come into the world, he chose to come into the world and become a man to die for our sins. Um, but before we get ahead of ourselves a little, a little bit too much, uh, I want to stop right there at the point of when he became a man uh, and, and lay some groundwork here. Uh, in the book of Romans, what it says, uh, it talks about Adam, and, it, and it, uh, it contrasts Adam, which was the first creation of God, contrasts him with Jesus Christ. It calls Jesus the second Adam. And uh, in Romans chapter 5, we see something here in verse number 12. Uh, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What is this talking about? Uh, what it's referring to is that when Adam and Eve were created, they were created good. The, the Bible says in Genesis that it, they were very good. They were a perfect creation. They had no sin. They were pure. But when they sinned, uh, they were corrupted, uh, which we talked about that early on in this teaching series. The word corrupt, it refers to something that was originally good. It was originally pure, um, but it was defiled. Uh, so you, you take you know, a big uh, drum of, of fresh, pure water, and you dr just drop a little bit of uh, acid into it. It was pure but now the whole thing's been defiled. It's 99% good, uh, but now the little bit that was mixed into the whole thing has made the, made the whole thing bad. Um, and now we talked about the, the original sin. We talked about the fact that mankind now, uh, as this scripture says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Uh, so as a result, Adam and Eve had a child, Cain, uh, and we saw from the, the book of Psalms, that he, uh, David, he said that in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, not in, uh, he wasn't born of fornication. What he's saying is that in the in the mix of my DNA there was sin that was being mixed in it. So even though I was in the beginning uh, a great creation, the greatest, uh, a pure, a perfect one, yet now in the DNA of mankind there's sin mixed in it. So we were born with a, a sinful nature, sinful tendencies. Uh, we we're not good, and every once in a while we do bad things. We are bad in our heart, to our core. That's why we do bad things. And every once in a while, we might do something good. Uh, we talked about that, that we feel this need because we're bad to, to become good. And so you know, God says in the book of Isaiah, all of your righteousnesses are as filthy rags in my sight. Even though you did something good, yet it came from a source of a corrupted heart. So God doesn't see it as good anyways. Um, but anyways, so uh, what we're seeing here is that Mankind, we've all been born because of our first father, Adam, that sin is passed through the man to the child. So what about Jesus? Did, Je what, did Jesus, as the eternal son of God, when he became a man, did he have this same thing that we have? No, he didn't. And why is that? It's because even though he was in the womb of a woman, uh, yet he did not come from the seed of mankind. So that, that, uh, that mix, that corruption that, that was mixed in his DNA, it wasn't in there because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a woman. Uh, there was, that's a big misconception. There was not a woman and a man that had sexual relations and then uh, it was the Son of God. And this is where, uh, just to note right now, 
uh, that Catholicism, it, it exalts Mary and calls her the mother of God. Um, the Bible never calls her the mother of God. That's not uh, the exaltation that the Bible gives of her. She was a sinful person just like any other person that's ever walked on the face of the earth. Um, she was favored of God because she feared God and wanted to keep his laws. And so therefore God gave her a privilege um, by bearing the eternal son of God. Um, but she, it, she, she was not the mother of God. She didn't conceive him. The Holy Ghost conceived Jesus in her womb. So she was just carrying the son of God and gave birth to him. Uh, Mary is never exalted to a place of worship in the Bible. In fact, it's the opposite, that she knew, she called Jesus her Lord and worshiped him. Uh, never, don't ever worship Mary. She's not worthy of worship. She shouldn't be worshiped. That's idolatry. That's breaking the first commandment. Um, so we see that Jesus Christ, the eternal God, that he became a man, and, and as a man, that he was not tainted, he was not corrupted by, by the sinful nature, that seed that is passed down through all mankind. I just want to read a couple other uh, scriptures here in Romans chapter uh, 5. Um, it says in verse number 16, And not as it was uh, by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the, the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, this is talking about Adam, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, talking about Jesus, shall many be made righteous. So it's clear that Adam brought sin and death to the entire human race. But on the contrary, Jesus, by being born without sin and by his obedience as uh, dying for our sins on the cross, he came to bring righteousness and life to the entire human race. So what I want to see here is that Jesus Christ, as a man, was without sin. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Just because he was a man did not mean that he had sin or that he had sin. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 22, uh, it says uh, that Jesus who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Uh, Isaiah 53 and verse number 9, that's a, a quote from there. It says that uh, he was without violence and there was no guile found in his mouth. Uh, in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 35, the angel that was talking to Mary, he says that holy thing uh, which is inside of thee shall be called the Son of God. Uh, he's called a holy thing. We saw um, from our, our lesson about what is good, what is truly something that is good we saw that God is the standard for what is good. Absolute perfection, absolute holiness, righteousness, justice, purity. Jesus Christ, as a man, was perfectly holy, absolutely clean and pure. Uh, John chapter 8 and verse number 46, I love this. Uh, Jesus even said of his own self, he, said, he asked the people a question. He said, Who, which of you will convince me of sin? Jesus put a challenge out there. <clears throat> he said, who can... Who can convince me of having committed sin? Uh, that would not be a good thing for anybody to put a challenge out. You know, can you convince me of sin? We all know that we've sinned, except this one, Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1 John chapter 3, in verse number 5, it says, In him was no sin. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, a uh, great scripture. It, um, I want to read it so I don't misquote it. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 4. Uh, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This man, Jesus, he was tempted as a little boy. He was tempted to disobey his parents. He was tempted to steal things and lie and be selfish as a little child. As he grew to be a man, he was tempted in every point like as we are. He's tempted with anger. He was tempted with uh, immorality. He was tempted to... Uh, to not put God first. He was tempted to, um, to tempt God. He was tempted 
uh, by Satan in Matthew chapter 4. He was tempted throughout his life. He was tempted in all points. He was tempted um, to a degree that no other man has been tempted, yet he was without sin. Why? Um, because it was not possible for him to sin. It's not possible for God to sin because he's God. Um, we look, when we go over to the trial of Jesus, when, when Jesus uh, was there and there was false accusations coming to him from every angle, um, the Pontius Pilate, he, he testified, I, I can't find any sin in this man. There's nothing wrong in this man. The people who were sending false accusations to him, they knew that there was, there was no justifying their, their accusations. They were all false. There was no sin in him. It was the, uh, it was the, the, the worst trial that's ever happened. Everybody knew this man has done nothing wrong. All of these accusations, they're wrong. And yet still, he did not try to justify himself. He didn't try to defend himself. That's because he came. He was born to die. Uh, but we see that there was, there was no basis for him being condemned and for being crucified. It's because he was the eternal son of God that became a man. Um, when he became, he, did, he became a man, he was no less God. It, what, Jesus was not uh, 50% God and 50% man. He was 100% God that robed himself in flesh. He took on flesh and walked around on the earth. God walked around. Um, this, is, this is very important. We're, we're laying this foundation, um, and, and to jump to the end just for a second to conclude it, is that if he was just a man like us, his sacrifice would have meant nothing because we have offended a holy God. We've offended eternal laws. And the only way, the only way that God can forgive sins is if that standard of God is met, if that righteous standard uh, is, is lived up to, is upheld. And, and so therefore, only Jesus could be our sacrifice. No other man, if you, if you sacrificed 10 billion men for the sins of the world, it would still fall short of the righteousness that's needed by God's law. But yet this man, just one man, being the eternal God, gave a sacrifice and it was worthy. He was able to bear the sins of all of the world and he was able to, to bear uh, a righteous, holy, eternal judgment upon himself, that his sacrifice was worthy. Uh, that's the point that we're getting at, that Jesus Christ, um, God the Father, uh, spoke in an audible voice to the people and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God was well pleased with the life and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. I want to see that. Um, so what was the point? What was the purpose? Uh, you know, did Jesus just come here uh, to be a, a great example to us? You know, a, a model like, you know, I've come now to declare how men should live. So, you know, we saw that the ancients, the philosophers, they taught us a certain way to live. But now the great expression of God, Jesus came and he taught us how to live. The golden rule. Was that the purpose that he came? Um, was his purpose to... Uh, just be a great prophet, that he was going to tell us about God and that he was going to tell us what the end will be like and, and how to make sure that we can know God. Uh, or is it deeper than that? It's much deeper than that. He didn't come just to be a teacher, to be a great example. He came to actually do a work for mankind. And, and he came, he was born to die. Now we see this in, Ro in the book of Romans in chapter number four, in verse number 25, it says that, um, who it's talking about Jesus who was delivered for our offenses and w was raised again for our justification in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 it says but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us in uh, chapter number 8 and verse number 32 uh, it says uh, talking about uh, verse number 31 it says who shall what shall we say then to these things if God be for us who can be against us he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That was the plan all along, before the foundations of the world. There was a plan, and it was that this one, this eternal, perfect, holy son, would become a man and would die for our sins. I want to read a scripture back from the book of Daniel uh, that also touches on this. Uh, Daniel chapter number 9. 
And uh, it says in verse number 24, uh, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel and he gave him this prophecy. He said, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks the street uh, shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Uh, and then it goes on, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city, and it goes on from there. Uh, so what's the point? We're showing that before Jesus came, there was a prophecy that Messiah was going to come, uh, that the reason that he was going to come was to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Uh, we're going to talk about reconciliation more in a little bit. Uh, but Messiah, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to be cut off. He's going to die. Why? Not for himself, but for the sins of the people so that they can be brought back to God. And this is uh, primarily referring to the Jewish people, uh, that, this, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised one that's going to come. And the specific reason he's going to come is, is not uh, just to be a king, not just to be a, a great ruler, a governor, but he's first going to come to be a sacrifice. We see that all throughout the Old Testament, the Messiah would be slain. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, we see that throughout uh, the Old Testament. So he was born to die. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Um, if you think that Jesus is anything else other than the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth, had no beginning, that no one created him, that he is God, who at one point in time became a man. He took flesh on himself. God walked among us for the specific purpose that he would die to make an end of our sins. Uh, you have a different Jesus. That's a different Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. And that Jesus cannot bring you to God. Even if people say that they believe in Jesus, oh, we believe in Jesus, which one? Um, because if you have any less Jesus than God himself, then his sacrifice was not good enough. It was not worthy. It did not attain to that righteous standard of God. And this is how I want to end, uh, by showing that. Um, there's there's uh, three things that I want to uh, show, three titles uh, or roles, positions that Jesus hold um, that only God himself can hold. A man cannot uh, hold these positions. The first one I want to see is in the book of First John. And uh, 1 John chapter number 2, it says this, uh, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, listen to this simple statement. Um, if there's, there's only one thing that will keep you out of heaven, um, I want to ask that question. Um, do, do you want to know God? Do you, do you want to be forgiven by God? Do you want to go to heaven? Uh, and if the answer is yes, if you're really seeking after God, there's only one thing that will keep you out of heaven. It's not failing to go to church or, or failing to do great works or being a good person. That's not what it's about. The only thing that will keep you out of heaven is sin. And sin is breaking God's laws. That's the only thing that will keep you out of heaven. Isaiah chapter 59, um, God, said, God says, My ear, I can hear you, um, but the problem is, is that your sins have separated between me and you. I want to save you. I want to hear you. I want to have friendship with you, but I can't because of your sin. Uh, that makes it simple. Uh, that, that's the only thing that we need to deal with is our sin. Um, but it's impossible for us to get out of on our own, which is hence the reason that we need a sacrifice. We need a savior. We need to be saved from our sins. And so what it says here in 1 John chapter 2, he says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Uh, what is an advocate? An advocate is basically, uh, in simple terms, an advocate is a lawyer. It's one who... Um, advocates for us, who, who goes, in, goes in, in our place to, to uh, plead our cause. Jesus Christ is that advocate. He is that lawyer. Get that picture in your mind 
uh, of a judge sitting on his throne. Uh, God, he has his laws, his books, our life out there. We're condemned. We're guilty. We stand before God with no righteousness. We're condemned. Uh, we deserve judgment. And, here, and we have an advocate. We have the one we can call on. Uh, you know, they say uh, you have a right to an attorney. That's what this is. Uh, if you realize when you go to court, you know, I need, I need help. I need an attorney. Uh, this, is, this is how it works with God. You first need to get to the place where you realize, I'm condemned before God. I've broken his laws. I need an attorney. I need someone to come and help me. And that's Jesus Christ. We call upon him to advocate for us, to step in our place. He's the advocate. And what an advocate does uh, is this thing right here called uh, reconciliation. Uh, the Bible says that he was in the world um, not, uh, not wanting to condemn us, but to reconcile us. He was in the world reconciling the world unto God. Uh, that's 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. So what he does is Jesus, being God, he's able to, to speak to God on, on the same holiness, the same level as God. He can speak to God, but he can also speak for man because he became a man so Jesus can take in one hand God, can take in mankind in the other hand, and bring them both together. The word reconcile, uh, it means to restore a friendship that was broken. Um, that uh, there's two parties, two people, that they're at enmity, they're at war, they, they have a disagreement, there's something that needs to happen. Jesus was the, the peacemaker. He was the one that came in um, to advocate, to, to speak on behalf of both people. Jesus speaks on behalf of God. Uh, you must repent. You must believe in me. You must come to God for, for forgiveness. But he also speaks for man. He comes to the Father and, and speaks for us. Here's my blood that was shed to God. Here's the forgiveness. Here's the payment. Here's the ransom that was made. Why is this important? It's important because no other man could do that. Do you really believe that when you go into a Catholic church, and there's a priest who is a man, who is a sinner, sitting on the other side of that confessional booth. Do you really believe that when you confess your sins to him, that he is able, that he has the authority to come boldly into the presence of God by his own merit, by this merit, by this priest, by his merit, and say, God, you need to forgive these people's sins. As a sinner, that's what they're saying. That's what Roman Catholicism is saying, is that this man has the authority to tell God to forgive the sins of mankind. You really believe that another sinful man can do that for you? I don't either. But uh, there's good news, is that we do have an advocate, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he is able to be our advocate because he is God that became man, suffered as a man for our sins. Hallelujah. Uh, the book of 1 Timothy, we see the second role, uh, and it's very similar to him being an advocate. Uh, and that's of a mediator. In uh, first, first Timothy, uh, chapter number 2, I want to uh, read the scripture. First Timothy, chapter number 2, uh, and it says in verse number 4, that it says about God, it says, Who will have all men to be saved? God wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It makes the emphasis there on the man Christ Jesus, that God became a man. Uh, and he is our mediator. Um, uh, an, an example of this that people teach otherwise, the Catholic Church, they teach that Jesus is not the mediator, but what we really need is we really need the Catholic Church, we need the Catholic priests, that they mediate for us to God. There are go in between, the middleman. In order to get to God, you have to go to the Catholic Church, you have to go to the Catholic priest. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that you have to be a part of the organization. If you want to know God, if you want to get to God, if you want to be forgiven, you have to be a Jehovah's Witness. You have to attend the meetings. You have to read the watchtowers. You have to go through them. You have to go through the governing body. And it's the same for every other religion on the face of this earth. Islam, if you want to know God, you have to be a Muslim. Uh, Mormons, if you want to know God, if you want to be forgiven, you have to be a Mormon, etc. 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 You have to go through these specific uh, intermediaries through these mediators but the bible is very clear <laughs> no there's one god and there's one mediator there's one going between between god and men it's the man christ jesus why why is it that jesus can be the only one that can be the mediator 
Be- because no other, no other man, no other system has died for my sins in my place before God. And even if somebody said that they did, and even if they really wanted to, it wouldn't be good enough because it wouldn't be a holy, eternal uh, life that was given on my behalf. The wages of sin is death. No organization, no church, no pastor, no priest, uh, no system, no law, no book. No one has eternal life to die for me and for the sins of this world. Only Jesus could do that, and only Jesus did do that. Therefore, he's our only mediator. Um, But we find one more, and that is that Jesus is our high priest. And um, that's what a priest does. A priest uh, is someone that you go to that represents God. The priest is able to speak for God uh, to man, and the priest is also able to look back at God and speak uh, to God for mankind. That's what we need. Um, Jesus said these words, I am the way. They asked him, how do we get to God? Where, how do we get to him? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, that is a very exclusive claim. It's an audacious claim, um, but yet it's a true claim. It's a, it's a righteous claim. He was righteously saying that because he's the only one that could fill that role. Uh, the book of Hebrews shows us that Jesus is our high priest. In verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Um, which also says right down there at the end, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come boldly because we can come through Jesus as our mediator. Um, Over in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, in verse number 25, it says, Wherefore he, Jesus, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, Jesus did this once, when he offered up himself. Um, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore." Jesus is our eternal high priest. He was always the high priest that became a man, offered himself, rose from the dead, lives, sits at the right hand of God. He's able to make intercession for mankind uh, in in the presence of God, before the face of God. So what's the point? Uh, The point is this, is that we are sinful. We've broken God's laws. We deserve to be punished by God, but he doesn't want us to be punished. If you're listening to this tonight, God does not want to punish you. He wants to save you. He made a way for you to be forgiven. Um, It was by sending his own son, the eternal son, became a man. As a man, he died in our place. He rose from the dead. Today, uh, he is our mediator. He is our lawyer. He's our advocate. He's our high priest. Uh, Tonight, you understand that you've fallen from God. You, you've gone astray. Uh, there's good news. That good news is that you have a payment that was made for you. You have a sacrifice. You have a savior. You have a lawyer. His name is Jesus. Uh, and somebody asked this question. They said, well, since Jesus died for the sins of the world, does that mean that everybody's forgiven? And the answer is no. There's something that we need to do. And this is exactly what we need to do. Jesus said, repent and believe. Believe the gospel. Um, Right now, wherever you are, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, Right now, whether you're at home, work, uh, wherever you are, uh, call out to God. uh, Cry from your heart, God, I am a sinner. I deserve to be punished, uh, but I don't want to. And Jesus, I believe in you tonight. I believe these things that I'm hearing, uh, that, that you died in my place for my sins. Jesus, please forgive me. Wash away my sins. Become my Savior tonight. Um, be my priest, be my lawyer, speak on behalf for me. I'm, I'm claiming your sacrifice. Jesus, save me from my sins tonight. Um, if that's your cry from your heart, you can have assurance uh, that uh, the Bible says whoever believes in Jesus um, has eternal life. So God bless you tonight. We'll see you next week in understanding the gospel.